Please rise for our call to worship. Sing praises to the Lord, for God has done glorious things. Shout aloud and sing for joy in the midst of our joys and sorrows. Shout aloud and sing for joy as we come to worship the God of all creation. The Old Testament reading is Isaiah chapter 65, beginning with the 17th verse. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create, for behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. 
For the days, for like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. On Wednesday morning, as you might imagine, uh, my telephone began to ring. Uh, some of us who preach, we share ideas during a week, especially when it's a hard week. There are a number of uh, preachers that I mentor. And the question that came Wednesday morning is, well, what are you going to say on Sunday? I responded to each by saying, we, we have a marvelous biblical text. It was prescribed for this day, Isaiah chapter 65. It just seems perfect in so many ways. You know, God is about to create a new heaven and a new earth. It talks about the wolf shall lie down with the lamb. It's God's Word, God's Word that we need. The first preacher who called me was in tears. He was so upset about the outcome of the election. He just felt it would be such catastrophe. Didn't know how he could even tell his children the news. He said, how can I preach come Sunday? I said, preachers have stood up in worse situations than this. Isaiah, for example. Isaiah stood in the rubble that was the city of Jerusalem. They weren't afraid a catastrophe would come. It had already come. The city was reduced to smoking rubble. And I, there was no economy, nothing. And Isaiah stood up in that and said, God is about to do a new thing. The third preacher who called me was very happy about the outcome of the election. I told him, preachers have stood up to preach on better days, right? The first preacher who stood up and said, Jesus is risen, or the first preachers who stood up and said, the Holy Spirit has dawned upon the church. There have been worse days. There have been better days. God is still God. Nothing's really changed. Isaiah is so interesting. When Isaiah talks about the new thing that happened, that's going to happen, he doesn't say, now your new king Zerubbabel, he's going to be your savior, or Cyrus the Persian, he's going to be your savior. No, what God says is, I, I, the Lord your God, am going to do a new thing. I will do it. On Wednesday, a, a reporter from Channel 9 uh, showed up here, pointed a camera at me and said, how, how, how do we bring people together now? How do we get unity? And I said, we, we don't have unity. We could pretend we have unity, but we're sorely divided. So that's what the first preacher actually asked me. He said, how do I preach to people who are so divided? I said, they were divided last Sunday. They were divided five years ago. They were divided 25 years ago. We're divided people, and the division is not political. The division that we suffer is within our own souls. We are divided within ourselves. If we learned anything this week is that America is full of broken people. And as best I can tell, most people voted and responded and all out of fear. We are people who are driven by fear. We are a very fearful people. And to a broken and fearful people, God comes and says, I'm going to do a new thing. So I was excited to come to church today for Holy Communion. This isn't a fake unity. This is a real unity. We're all broken people. We don't have a leg to stand on, but God is good. God is still God. We come to Jesus' table. I have a, sort of a three-point sermon today. I know you're thinking he just used up one of them, but... That was just the intro. Here are three things I thought about in light of Isaiah 65 and what went on this week. The first is this. 
thinking about the outcome of the election and what everybody has said about it, I think the gauntlet has been thrown down to the church to rise to a certain kind of challenge. See, one of the things that happens in America is we become spectators and we become complainers. So when something's wrong, we blame somebody. And when something needs to happen, we hope we'll elect somebody who will come in and be the great savior. But we're called to be citizens. We get the country we ask for. It's our country. It's a democracy. And the church, above all people, it's, we're, called, we're called to be busy doing God's work. We're called to remind the world of what God made us to be, to be our noblest selves. I, I interviewed quite a number of people this week who uh, voted for President-elect Trump, and I asked them why they voted for him, and it was interesting. Every answer I got is entirely in sync with God's vision for what the church needs to be about. It's interesting. Part of it could have been quoted from Isaiah 65. I don't know if anybody did that, but in Isaiah 65, when, when he talks about God's vision, for human good, he says this thing, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. Like overwhelmingly, Donald Trump was voted for by people across this country. See, everything's booming in Charlotte and we forget it. But if you look across this country, the Rust Belt, so many of those red counties that you saw coming up on the map the other night, people don't have jobs. They're losing their homes. They're struggling. Hmm? Isaiah's vision is that God wants people to be able to work. God wants people to be able to thrive. God wants people to be able to be responsible. God wants people to enjoy the fruits of their labors. There's another twist to that that's way more troubling. And I hate to share this with you, but I just think it's true. I read an op-ed in the New York Times on Thursday from a rabbi named Mark Lerner. He was talking about why it is that overwhelmingly across this country, poor white people voted for Donald Trump. And what he said, I think, is right, is that among poor whites in America, there is great resentment toward wealthy white people. And that's part of why they're upset and why they voted the way that they do. And the wealthy white people would be us. You see it across the country, but it's also right here in Charlotte. If you get out of Myers Park and talk to people in other parts of the city, what you can find is there are poor whites in Charlotte, and they look at us, and they resent us. As a church, we could say, well, that's their problem. That's just too bad for them. But I don't think God wants that for us. God talks about the day when the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. I think God asks us maybe not to be the kind of people, not that we are, but how do we befriend? How do we change that kind of thing? I talked to a couple of people. They said they voted for Donald Trump because security is their one issue. And let's be very clear, we live in a very dangerous world. When Isaiah spoke, the people of Israel had, this is interesting, the people of Israel lived, it was Babylon and Persia, and what they were the victims of what was a state-sponsored terrorism, and this was not God's will. God wanted them to be safe. God wanted them to be secure. That's part of God's thing, just safety for God's people. They don't get killed out there. One person said to me, you know, globalism is a frightening thing for Christianity. This is interesting. We talk about globalism and trade, but one of the things that happens with globalism is that Christianity keeps being diminished and it keeps seeming like it's more and more at risk, and that should be of concern to us. We need to stand up in this world and say the Christians are still here. Jesus is still our Lord. There's a spiritual crisis that the church has to rise to. And then there's another thing. I talked to several people who said to me, I'm a, I'm a one-issue person. One guy explained it to me this way. He said, I vote on one issue only, and that's that Supreme Court seat because I'm pro-life. I thought about that because I believe that when there's life in a womb, that God is really rooting for that life. God already loves that life. It's interesting. But then there's the other side of this that's harder to talk about. I hope you'll hear me kindly and in the spirit in which it's intended. You know, Donald Trump is our president-elect, and I began on Wednesday morning to pray for him, and I will continue to pray for him, and you should as well. I know people that are rooting for him to fail spectacularly, and this is foolish, and it is not of God. 
we pray for our president, we pray for our country, we pray for its people. There's a piece of that, though, that we have to talk about, is that uh, Isaiah, when he thought about the dawning of God's kingdom, he, he, he wanted the people to be holy. In the church, we care about holiness. Part of what we do here in the church is character formation. We raise children in our church. We want them to grow up to be holy. And I may be the only person who feels this way, but I feel like it would be a wonderful thing if the President of the United States could be a role model for young people in our country. We've had quite a few presidents who were not. This time we had two candidates, neither of which should really be a role model for young people. But Donald Trump has been elected, and in the church we just have to say this clearly. If you have a son, I have a son. You don't want your son to grow up to be like Donald Trump. You don't want your son to grow up to be somebody who gropes women or grades them by the shape of their bodies and thus demeans them. You don't want your son to grow up to be somebody who makes fun of other people, especially the disabled. You don't want your son to grow up to be somebody who calls other people names. You see, we have some core values in the church, and a lot of people were worried that they're up for grabs right now, that they're at risk. It's been a spike. It's not Donald Trump's fault, but there's been a spike in kind of hate things this week, and a lot of people are fearful. People who've come here from other countries, people who are gay, people who are Muslim. My wife, Lisa, has a friend who's African-American. She just told her she just went to the store the other day and she got out of her car. And a white guy came up to her and said, Trump, Trump, Trump. Let's be very clear. We stand with all people who are at risk. We stand with those who are hated by others. We stand with those that others ridicule or even are afraid of for no good reason. Let me be clear with you. As your pastor, I love you, and I don't want to see any of us making fun of people, saying derogatory things about other people. It's not who we are. We're called to be holy. We have disabled people in our building every day. We have an arts program through UMAR every day in this building. We have adults who are mentally and physically challenged. If I ever see one of you making fun of them, you're going to have me to deal with. This is not what God's people do. And we have to redouble our efforts to be God's people during these days. Our task could well be described by these words from President Lincoln. At the end of the Civil War, you talk about a country divided. <clears throat> he had it. Here's what he said. The prayers of both sides could not be answered. The Almighty has his own purposes. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive to finish the work that we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds. This is what God's asking of us. Here's the last thing, and I know I'm talking too long. Nothing changed on Tuesday. God is still God. I love the phrase, in Isaiah's text, uh, God says, uh, before they call on me, I will answer them. Like, that's great. Like, before you even think to ask God for help, God's already working on helping you. It's a lovely thing. Uh, I was, uh, last Sunday night, um, I was with our confirmation class, a uh, gaggle of eighth graders, and what they do with me each year is we have a, you know, senior pastor Q&A. So they submit anonymous questions. It's just everything, like, when was your first kiss? You know, meaty things like that. Or, or why are you a Duke fan? You know, anyway, great questions. And, uh, but the very best question, I don't know which child submitted it, but it was good. The question was, what's the hardest thing God ever got you through? I go home and spend the afternoon on that one. What's the hardest thing God ever got you through? You see, we go through hard times, but God is still God, and we can trust God, and 
What what Isaiah says is that that, that what what God's purpose is is not something that any president or anybody who almost was president is going to get done. What God's project is is that things will become, things will turn out in such a way that the wolf will lie down with the lamb. And we still live in a world where the wolf devours the lamb, but, but God's vision is for a world where the wolf lies down with the lamb. And that's going to take some time. And in the meantime, what do we do? And this is the last thing from Isaiah. I love this. God says, I want my people to be like trees. I want my people to be like trees. Like trees are amazing. Like if you look at a tree, it's really old. It's been around forever. And the strength of the tree is not what you see that's obvious above the ground. The strength of the tree are those roots that are hidden and that go down deep and they get their nourishment from way deep in the soul in the dark where nobody can see. That gives the tree the strength. Storms come and go. Presidents come and go. Governments come and go. Crises come and go. The tree's still there. And what's amazing about trees is that when they suffer loss, it is then that they are at their most beautiful. And we're seeing it right now. The beauty that we see out there is the leaves are dying. But there's a beauty in the loss. J.R.R. Tolkien wrote The Lord of the Rings, and he was a lover of trees all of his life. And so in The Lord of the Rings, he created these tree-like characters called Ents who can talk. <laughs> And what's amazing about the ants, if you know this, is, is the, the, these trees, they speak very slowly. And I think it was Mary or Pippin asked them why they speak so slowly, and the, one of the ants answered by saying, we speak slowly because anything worth saying is worth saying slowly, and anything worth hearing is worth hearing slowly. My brothers and sisters, I think God is asking us to slow down and to listen. And if you've got to talk, Maybe you say something that's worth saying, something that's holy, something that builds up God's kingdom. Thanks be to God.
Hey, thank you for watching. And uh, we hope you got something out of that. If you have any feedback for us, any response that was helpful to you, we'd, we would love to hear that. Please let us know. And everything that we put out is free and we want it to be that way. But if you're able and feel led to, uh, to support the mission of our church or the cost of providing this online content, here's how to do so.